Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today I wanted to continue our uh, little adventures through uh, Mr. Mr. Fogg's amazing uh, optimization manuals. And uh, I thought what we might look at today is really, really important topic in performance programming. It's loop unrolling and dependency chains. So hopefully through, uh, throughout today's video, we can have a bit of a look at how you can use um, your knowledge of dependency chains and unrolling loops to really gain a lot of performance. Okay, so first of all, I've got this little program here. I think I might put the source code for this program up for the uh, Patreons, uh, just as a little thank you. But this, uh, this program here that we'll run, we'll look through the source code. Yeah, it's just a little demo program. So in it data, we don't really have to worry about that. Just initializes data with a bunch of random values. But so what I'm gonna do today is uh, run through two algorithms. The first one is just gonna be a sum of uh, doubles in a double array. And the second algorithm will be a little bit more interesting. That's gonna be the standard deviation. So uh, I used to work in stats for um, a psychiatrist for mental health uh, data. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, but standard deviation is something really, really important. All right, but let's just run this program and have a bit of a look at what it does. Okay, C++ sum of doubles. All done the summing tests. Uh, hopefully you can see that. So if we just scroll up a little bit. Okay, so the initial version, the kind of base case, standard C++ code takes about 1.355 seconds. And uh, then we move down to here, C++ sum of doubles unrolled takes 0.62 seconds. So that's considerably faster. Whatever this unrolling business is, it's definitely working. Uh, the next one is AVX, which takes about 0.413 seconds. And the final example there is unrolled AVX, which takes 0.344 seconds. So the question is, what is this unrolling business? Maybe before we go through that, I should say that I'm running a bunch of stuff here. Like there's a screen recorder and all sorts of stuff going on in the background. So the actual times that you will get from, from uh, doing these techniques might be better than this. Um, yeah. Uh, I did some other tests. I had um, a billion elements in the loop. And the sum ran about 3.8 times faster. Uh, but if you run it with a billion uh, elements in the loop, then it's really the CPU is not getting any opportunity to cache or to use its cache. Um, so that's probably not really realistic. Um, the other one that I did was uh, a thousand repetitions of one million elements without anything running in the background. And that takes about, uh, or, or the speed gain there is about 4.79 times. Okay, so this final unrolled version here without anything running in the background was about 4.79 times faster than the original C++ version. I think realistically, the actual uh, speed that you could hope to get in, you know, running code would be maybe somewhere in between. So you'd probably be looking at about, I don't know, about four times the speed or something like that. And uh, if we just come over here to sum H, we can have a bit of a squiz at the very first algorithm. So this is it just here. This is sum. This is the top C++ version. So this is uh, this one. Right here. Okay, so this is uh, pretty much the standard way that you would uh, usually approach summing an array of, of doubles. Something like um, you just set a total to zero, then for every element in that array, you run through and add the elements to the total, and then you return your total. Fair enough, pretty good. All right, but the second one down here, this is um, what we've done here is called unroll the loop. Now, we've got ourselves what's called four accumulators. Um, this is pretty much lifted straight from uh, Agnafog's manual. So uh, right here, yeah, manual two, optimizing assembly. So the section you want to look at, 9.5, break dependency chains. Yeah, that's where this example comes from. Okay, so what we've got here is four accumulators, total one, total two, total three, and total four. And I've rearranged things just a little bit here. So I've set um, a pointer data to D, which was the array that we're trying to sum. And uh, I just did that because for me, it makes the code easier to read. Um, so we can just, you know, plus equals four to data here each time and count up to uh, a quarter of the original count. So it's a little bit strange. It seems like we've made the, the loop larger just here, but we haven't. Um, what we've really done is uh, just added four accumulators. Yeah, so each iteration of the loop just here, instead of summing one value and uh, adding it to total one, we're summing four values and adding them to four separate subtotals. So total one is taking, you know, every element that's evenly divisible by four. 
um, just because I'm counting up in fours here. Uh, total two is taking every element that's one above uh, a multiple of four in the loop. And total three is taking every element that's two above a multiple of four. And total four is taking every element that's three above a multiple of four. And this makes the code considerably faster. So if we have a look here, uh, the performance ratio down the bottom here is really what we should be looking at. So 2.18 times faster uh, than when it's unrolled. So it's easy to believe that the CPU just grabs an instruction and executes it and then retires it and then grabs the next instruction and executes it and retires it. What actually happens is uh, the CPU reads in a whole bunch of instructions into what's called reservation stations or instruction queues, instruction buffers, uh, whatever you want to call it. And the instructions sit there until the resources that they require become available. So the resources are things like the data operands that they need, as well as a pipe to actually execute. And the CPU has multiple pipes inside it or, uh, or ports that can take instructions and execute them. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, these ports can execute at the same time. So if we have a bit of a look over here, I've got uh, a Skylake CPU. So if we have a look over here uh, at manual number three, micro architecture, uh, I've looked up the Skylake CPU and we can see over here, um, Mr. Fogg's listed the ports. So port zero just here and port one down here. And then we've got the types of instructions that go through those ports and also the expected or, or the general uh, latency of that. We'll have a, a bit more of a squiz at latency in just a little bit. Uh, but what you can see here is that there's actually um, eight ports in my CPU. Uh, we've got an integer port, an integer port down here, and another integer port just there, and another integer port at the end. So we've actually got like four integer ports, which means that uh, if we're performing integer operations, so long as the operations don't require data that hasn't been computed, um, we could potentially send four integer operations to their ports at once. And this is really, really important because that means that we get four times the performance. Okay, that's good. So if we come back to the code, um, all right, so over here, what we were doing was summing up a bunch of doubles. And if you think about it, um, with one accumulator, so before when we were just using um, total just here, the CPU can't sum up the second iteration of this loop before it's finished the first. So in other words, the CPU can't sum on um, D1 before it's summed on D0. Yeah, so it's it's summing all of the elements of this D array onto total. And the way that we've written it just here, it won't be able to sum on, say, D10 before it's summed on D9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And it won't be able to sum on D20 before it's summed on all of the values previous to that. So the way that we've written it just here with one accumulator, um, we're forcing all of these additions through one port. Means that we get none of the simultaneous execution in the different ports. But if we move down here to the second uh, little example, this is exactly what we've told the CPU to do. We've said that you can actually sum with four different accumulators. So if there's four ports available to do uh, this floating point double addition just here, then all four of these can go through at the same time. And the reason is because they've got nothing to do with each other. Like total one just here uh, doesn't really care if uh, total two's finished summing anything. Uh, total three doesn't care what total one and total two are doing. You know, none of these values relies on the other. So every iteration of this loop, we're potentially moving multiple values through our, um, uh, through our floating point ports. Uh, I should say at some point that what we've done here is called unrolling the loop or I've unrolled it so that now it's executing four iterations per iteration. And to do that, you've got to divide your count by however many times you're unrolling the loop. And then you've also got to be careful to uh, actually address the correct indices inside the loop. Yeah, but this is called loop unrolling. Uh, I tend to only unroll things in powers of two. Uh, that's just me, but yeah, so I'll either unroll it, you know, twice or four times or eight times, potentially 16. Uh, depending on what sort of mood I'm in. <laughs> yeah, but whenever you do unroll a loop, so if the original count wasn't evenly divisible by four, then this loop isn't going to add on those last little bits. So say our count has um, 14 in it, uh, then it's going to have two extra at the end. Yeah, so, so we can sum up the first 12 using this 
you know, fast bit of the loop. But then at the end, we will have to sum up the residuals, the extra two that were left over. Okay, and I also, I love Mr. Fogg's attention to detail. So this is really, really cool. Um, this is a really good illustration of exactly what we're talking about here. So you see this last little bit just here, how it's braced or how it's bracketed. Uh, somebody, some, somebody a long time ago said, those aren't brackets, those are parentheses. I wasn't sure what they were. Uh, so I just nodded my head and smiled politely. Uh, if we actually, if we were to do this, Okay, say we're returning uh, pretty much the same sum, but without those brackets, um, we get the same thing happening. Without the parentheses, sorry, uh, we get much the same thing happening. So there's, say for example, there's, there's two ports in our CPU. Um, while one of the ports is doing this first sum just here, the other port will be sitting there saying, well, I really want to sum on total three, but I can't because I don't know what the answer to this first sum is. So eventually that's, you know, that's going to finish and uh, this second port can start summing on total three. But at the same time, uh, the other port's going to start saying, well, I'd really like to sum on total four, but I can't. I have to wait for the result of this. So it all becomes this, uh, this idea of um, ports and waiting for results that need to be computed. We want to eliminate that. We want these results to be computed at the same time. And if we put our brackets like this... Um, what's going to happen here is that one of the ports can do this first sum and the next port can do the second sum. And then once both of those little subtotals are um, summed together, we can add the uh, subtotals. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's, you know, another example, a sort of scalar example of taking advantage of these uh, ports as well, just by using uh, bracketing or bracing, bracing, parentheses. Yeah, so the result's not going to be a whole lot different. Uh, I should mention that later on when we do a bit of uh, SIMD code, um, the results that you get will often be more precise uh, when you unroll loops and uh, do things with uh, vector operations. Anyway, let's have a bit of a look over here at our uh, next little time here. So, so this one here was quicker again. This was 0 0.413 uh, seconds. So this is about 3.3 .3 times faster than the original C code. And if we have a look at uh, some double assum, uh, jump over to assembly where the real speed happens, uh, we can see what's happened here in the uh, first sum AVX example. So what I want to say is that uh, AVX, or using vector instructions, so you can do the same thing with uh, intrinsics without actually jumping into uh, assembly. It's really great. Okay, so sum AVX, push RBX. We've got to save the call as RBX. RBX. Uh, so this is basically going to do uh, exactly what our unrolled loop did. It's pretty much going to do this. Um, so the AVX registers each hold four doubles. Yeah. So what we can do is just add four doubles onto four separate counters each uh, each iteration of the loop. Um, okay. So VPXOR that just zeros the uh, register so that YMMO has nothing in it. So YMMO I'm using as my four counters uh, Mov EBX EDX. So we actually need a backup of the original count which is passed in EDX uh, We need a backup of that so that we can figure out if we've got uh, residuals or not at the end uh, SAR EDX2 that just divides EDX by four since each iteration of the loop we're doing uh, four sums and uh, It's exactly the same as over here count divided by four uh, if that results in zero, then we still might have residuals, so we jump to residuals. Otherwise, we start the fast part of our loop. So this just here, v add pd, is um, an AVX instruction. It might be AVX2. Uh, I think it's just AVX. Um, vp add, or v add pd, add packed doubles. That's going to grab the next four doubles from whatever RCX is pointing to. Uh, RCX is pointing to our data, by the way. Uh, again, that's just the way that um, C++ passes parameters. I should say, um, if you want to look up the calling convention, there's another uh, Mr. Fogg's manuals will tell you uh, how parameters are passed. Or I made a video about it too. I think the last video. Anyway, we sum on the next four doubles to our four accumulators, all inside uh, YMMO just here. And then we add RCX32 or 32 bytes. We move up to the next four doubles. Then we deke EDX, our count, and we jump if we've still got more. 
So once we've finished doing that, um, we've actually finished the uh, vector part of our loop. We still might have to deal with residuals. Uh, I do want to say this little bit just here. Uh, this is a horizontal sum. So if we just hit a bit of a, if we just hit run, we can sort of have a, have a bit of a look at what's going on here. Okay, here we go. So if we just add a watch, um, where's a watch? Where's a watch? Add a watch. I've already got 300 million. What do you want to add more for, mate? Uh, okay, so this is why MMO. Uh, I don't know how familiar we are with um, AVX registers and SIMD registers, but hopefully fairly familiar. So uh, if we come down here to uh, F64, looking at the values in uh, a uh, Y MMO as uh, 64 bit uh, doubles. Okay, so there's our four little accumulators just there. And uh, if we step through the next line. Um, Okay, the low, uh, this uh, horizontal add just here, it's going to add the low two doubles and store the result in, uh, well, there in the low bit, in the low double. And it's going to add the high two doubles together and store the result in the high doubles. Uh, v perm. Okay, so this instruction will copy the uh, high part of YMMO over to the low part of YMM1. And finally... Uh, we can add the high and low doubles together. So that's um, this one and this one. Yeah, so that's all, all three of those instructions are just a horizontal add for AVX instructions. Uh, it used to be in SSE days that you could just do a horizontal add, H add PD, and it would sum them all up together. Uh, but nowadays, I don't think there's any instruction that horizontally adds all uh, four doubles. Anyway, once we've moved into... Uh, SSE registers, XMMO and XMM1, uh, we can sum up the final residuals. So in order to figure out whether we've got any residuals to sum, we can just AND with uh, three. So this is the reason why I personally tend to unroll loops in powers of two. So if you've unrolled it uh, four times, then you can just AND with three to figure out if there's any residuals. If you've unrolled it eight times, then you can AND with seven. Or if you've unrolled it 16 times, then you can AND with 15, etc. So it just makes the code a little bit easier or a little bit quicker. Um, okay, so if there's no residuals, then we just jump to finished. And there is no residuals. So we pop RBX, the call is that, and we return. Uh, with the value in uh, here. Yeah, there. So that's the answer just there. Uh, the next one, okay, so the next one that we should have a bit of a look at is the uh, unrolled AVX. So even though the AVX registers are sort of unrolled themselves, I mean, they deal with four iterations of the loop uh, just naturally, um, we can still apply the same ideas from Mr. Fogg's manual and uh, unroll the AVX loop further. Uh, so in this second example, the unrolled AVX, uh, I've unrolled the loop uh, four times and we're using four accumulators, and each one of those accumulators is itself uh, accumulating four different doubles. So we're effectively accumulating 16 different uh, double accumulators here. Accumulator, see if you can say accumulator a few more times. <laughs> accumulator, accumulator, accumulator. All right, so we've got 16 accumulators going. Maybe I'll just put a breakpoint there and we'll run it. Okay, so we've got these four accumulators. Maybe I could just hit watches on all of them. All right, but if we just step through the code, uh, they all get zeroed at the start. Then we uh, save a copy of our count, exactly the same as before. Okay, so this time, because we've got uh, unrolled AVX, uh, we're actually dealing with 16, uh, 16 doubles each iteration of the loop. So we've got to divide our count by 16. And if that results in zero, we jump to residuals, but it doesn't. Uh, okay, so this is an unrolled AVX loop just here. Uh, it's much the same idea as before. Uh, okay, so what we've got here is uh, the first four doubles are going to be added to YMM0. Uh, the next four doubles, which are 32 bytes above the address of the first four, uh, notice that here in assembly, we actually do uh, the pointer arithmetic ourselves, kind of manually, uh, where in C++, you can just say plus four. Uh, in assembly, you'd have to go, you know, plus 16. Anyway, the next four doubles are added to YMM1, the next four doubles to YMM2, and the next four doubles to YMM3. So if we have a bit of a look over here, 
Okay, so that's the very first four doubles from the array in YMM0. Uh, that's the next four in YMM1. Where are we? The next four in YMM3. And finally, the last four in YMM... Uh, actually three. So the other one was meant to be two. <laughs> Yeah, so we've just got 16 different doubles being added in 16 different accumulators. Then we add RCX 128, so you do have to be careful that you get your arithmetic right here, but uh, 16 doubles equals 128 bytes. We dig EDX our count, and we jump if we've got more to do. Okay, so if we just jump down here to when we're done with that loop. Uh, so the same applies as, as before with our... Um, with our C++ code, we've got to sum the subtotals. Yeah, we've got to sum the subtotals. So the subtotals are in YMM0, YMM1, YMM2, and YMM3. And what I decided to do was sum 0 and 1 together, then sum 2 and 3 together, and then sum 0 and 2 together. Yeah, so we end up with four subtotals, uh, all in YMM0. Then we can perform a, a horizontal add to get the single scalar subtotal so far. And we might still have some residuals, so we do a little bit of an AND with 15 just here. Yeah, since we're dealing with 16 uh, doubles each iteration. And uh, yeah, if there's any extra there to, to add on, we do that in a uh, scalar loop. Uh, do we need to call V0 upper? I don't know. Let's have, a <laughs> let's have a look. Yeah, so you can read uh, Mr. Fogg's blog post on the topic. Do we need to call V0 upper? Uh, finally, we pop RBX and we return. So the performance gains that you can get by unrolling a loop, I mean, the same technique works in uh, vector instruction sets, your AVX and SSE, uh, just as well, if not better. I mean, you get really good performance gains by unrolling um, vector instructions. Okay, so if you come over here to uh, Mr. Fogg's fourth instruction uh, manual, or the, the manual on instruction tables, uh, this will show you uh, a little bit more about your instructions. So the one that we were actually executing then was VADPD. Um, so he's listed that here for my CPU, which is a Skylake. Now he's listed that here just as add uh, PD. Yeah, it's all, all pretty much the same speed, so we listed them together. But VVM was the version that we were doing. So we were using two vector instructions, that's the VV, and the M stands for memory. And over here in the latency column, we can see four. If you scroll up the top, you'll see that that's the latency column. And latency is the amount of clock cycles that would... Uh, be consumed if the instructions were completely dependent on each other. So latency is the time that we're trying to get away from. We want to we want to execute more instructions than um, you know one quarter per clock cycle. So with the uh, add PD, the latency is four. It would normally take four clock cycles if we had a big string of these things together. So if we have a bit of a look over here at our uh, original C++ code, this total plus equals D just here, that's going to get that four clock cycle latency. Yeah, because all of the pipes are going to be waiting for all of the other pipes and nobody can execute before everything prior to the um, current iteration is uh, executed. And the reciprocal throughput is this second column here, which says 0 0.5. Now, to figure out how many uh, times you could uh, unroll a loop, uh, theoretically, and still gain performance. The optimal amount of time that you could unroll a loop is the latency divided by the reciprocal throughput. So here we've got uh, 4 divided by 0 0.5, which is 8. Um, so in theory, we could have unrolled our loop another four times um, with, the, uh, with the vector instructions over here, and uh, we would have gotten even more speed. Uh, but the re the returns on uh, unrolling these loops is is you know often not going to reach that theoretical maximum uh, speed. However, I dare say you could probably get a little bit more speed if you unroll this another four times. Uh, maybe anyway. Yeah, something to consider is the fact that the loop itself uh, actually consumes pipes. Yeah, so 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 this add RCX just here, this deek EDX and this jump not zero, these all consume pipes as well. Um, so you you know you very rarely actually get the maximum uh, from unrolling loops. Uh, but it is good to know. Yeah, that's how you would compute the theoretical maximum number of times. This is all explained in uh, Mr. Fogg's manual. So I think uh, over here in this uh, second manual, Optimizing Assembly, he explains uh, how to compute that. Okay, so moving on to the next example. Now, the next example was 
standard deviation. So if I can just comment that out and we'll run it again. Uh, this is going to run through the sums first because I wasn't clever enough to put a go to at the start. Okay, here we go. Standard deviation. So this is only slightly more complicated. Uh, the time taken for the perfectly normal standard deviation algorithm that comes to my mind whenever I think about standard deviation, the time that that takes is 2.319 seconds. Yeah, but so this second one just here is standard deviation one pass. Now this is already taking uh, about twice as fast as the original. So you see here that the performance ratio is about two. So that means it's about double the speed of the original. And what I want to point out that is it's super important to choose a good algorithm to start with. Um, for something like standard deviation, uh, you know, it's been studied for so many years by so many amazingly intelligent people. And you'd be a fool just to go ahead and try and uh, optimize your, you know, naive version of standard deviation like this one here that it's just not a good algorithm. So if you come over here to the standard deviation page and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see this rapid calculation method. Yeah, and it's this top one here that we're using. Yeah, this algorithm just here. You really want to choose a good algorithm to start with. So this one pass standard deviation is already twice as quick as the uh, regular two pass method. Um, the two pass method is the one where you uh, first you compute the mean, then you run through your data again and compute the standard deviation. Uh, anyway, if we come down a little bit more, we can see the unrolled one pass algorithm is about 3.7 times faster than the original. And finally, down here, we've got a, a, an assembly AVX version of the one pass algorithm, which is about 18 times faster than the original algorithm. Uh, what I will say is that um, that's not likely the uh, performance that you'd get if you're running this code in a different situation. I mean, I'm just running, you know, millions of loops here. Uh, in the background on this computer here, I'm running an OBS. And uh, without running OBS, this standard deviation down here is about 25 times faster than the original. Uh, but if I increase the number of elements in the array up to a billion, so that we're not getting the effects of caching, then the standard deviation is only about 11 times faster. Um, so the actual performance that you'll get from these algorithms may differ from those you've seen in advertising. All right, but let's have a bit of a look at how this, uh, how this standard deviation works. Uh, yeah, they're for the population standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation is, you know, you can do it just as fast. It's just a, a matter of dividing it by uh, the DF minus one. Okay, so we've got our camera back up and running. I hope it just works. Okay, so the standard two pass uh, version of standard deviation, you run through and you compute the average. And then after that, you square the difference between the data and the average. You divide it by the count and you return the square root of the total. Uh, if you're doing the sample standard deviation, then you divide it by the count minus one. Never mind, this is not a statistics lesson. Okay, but the standard deviation in one pass, uh, you do sort of something similar, except uh, you kind of compute the mean and the difference at the same time. Uh, you get two accumulators, S1 and S2. S1 just does the, the sum of the data, exactly the same as we were doing before with our doubles. I should mention that this is floats now that we're using. Yeah, single precision floats. Um, the performance that you get from AVX when you're doing floating points uh, algorithms is very, very, very good. Uh, anyway, the, um, the second accumulator here sums up the data squared. Yeah, and then you do this little shebang at the end and Bob's your uncle. Okay, so, but we can unroll that. So this is the third version down here. So this is uh, this version just here. So it's about 3.7 times. No, uh, yeah, about 3.7 times as fast as my naive method just here. Uh, so the third version down here, I just unrolled it once. And exactly the same idea as before with our summing of the doubles. Uh, we just allow each one of these little sums here to accumulate uh, a different uh, iteration of the loop or I value. Yeah, so while S1 underscore one is summing up uh, data I, S2 can be going through another pipe and summing up uh, data I plus one. Yeah, but I only, only unrolled it once, so we might have one residual. So at the end, we've just got to sum up those two subtotals, S underscore, or S1 underscore one and S2 underscore two, and then the same with the S2 subtotals, and we do our little shebang and we return. Uh, if I have a look over here, at our uh, standard deviation in ASM. 
Uh, I've unrolled this once as well. So each one of these uh, AVX registers can deal with, what's it gonna be, eight uh, floating point operations at once. Yeah, so we're effectively doing 16 at the, at the, same, uh, at the same time for each uh, iteration of the loop. Okay, so why MM0 just here is taking the place of S1 underscore one. So uh, it and why MM1 are both gonna be summing up the totals and YMM2 and YMM3 are going to be summing up the squares. Uh, yeah, analogous to these uh, four little accumulators just here. Yeah, and there it is just there. So, so for this algorithm here, we can actually use a little bit of a, a little bit of a trick here. This is so this is only going to work in modern CPUs, but this is the uh, FMAD or the floating point multiply and add instruction set. So YMM1 and YMM0 are just summing up the values that we read from, uh, from the data. Uh, YMM2 and YMM3 have to sum up the squares of those values. So uh, FMAD231PS, what it's gonna do is multiply uh, the operands two and three, so these fours just here, YMM4, and it's gonna add the result to YMM2, or the first operand, yeah, because it's 231. So that's pretty much exactly what we want. We want to square the values that you read in four and uh, sum them to our little accumulators. After the loop, it's pretty much the same stuff as we had before. We've got to sum up our subtotals. Uh, we've got to perform a bunch of horizontal additions and then uh, deal, with any, uh, deal with any residuals. Yeah, and then that's the final little bit there of the computation. Or... Um, where are we? Yeah, that's this bit. No, yeah, it's not vectorized. Yeah, it's just scalar, the same as the C++. And over here we've got test timer. So I was just using clock. Uh, so if you want to really accurately time things, and you probably want to read, uh, you probably want to get, uh, is it RDTSC? Read the timestamp counter. So I guess the take home message of all this, the reason why uh, these unrolling, unrolled loops uh, actually run faster is just that we're breaking the dependency chains. So whenever instructions are dependent on data that hasn't been computed, um, then those instructions can't begin executing until that data is, is, is computed, you know, until the resource is available. And things get mighty, mighty complicated. I mean, if you look down in a very deep level at how these things work, um, the reservation stations, how they work, and the, the algorithm that it uses, it's called something like um, Tomasulo, Tomasulo, something like that. And we've got a reorder buffer in there as well that's uh, divvying out the instructions. But on a high level, if you just watch out for the potential pipes that could execute instructions, well, I mean, you, you really want to push as much data through those pipes in parallel as you possibly can. Yeah, anyway, uh, it's really worth reading all of the sections or the appropriate sections on, on this target hardware uh, in Mr. Fogg's manuals. Yeah, really worth reading. If you just want to clear up a few things that maybe I haven't gone into in, in a great deal of detail, really worth reading. Uh, that's about all that I wanted to say. I did make another YouTube channel, so if you want to check that out, uh, I'll have a link in the bottom. Uh, it's only got like uh, bacon cakes and uh, a plastic video up there at the moment, but hopefully more can go up there soon. And I just want to say thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your manuals, Mr. Fogg, and have a good day.